Do you see it? I don't see it, but it has to be there. There's nowhere else it could be. Poop knuckles. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Axe. Well, I'm in the shop making chips once again. It's great to be here, but I'm feeling a little rusty. It's been about three months since I've actually stood at a machine tool. So I thought I'd ease back into things with an easy afternoon project, which also happens to be a great one for beginners, and that's to make your own brass scriber. Now, longtime viewers of my channel will know that I used a brass scriber that was shop made for many, many years based on ClickSpring's awesome design, uh, but then one day it disappeared, and well, it did in fact literally disappear. Went to grab it, couldn't find it. I turned my shop upside down looking for that thing. And I thought, well, at that point I knew the move was coming and I thought, well, it'll turn up when I move. It never did. I gutted that shop, no brass scriber. I hope it's having fun on the farm that it went to live on with all the other brass scribers. And in the meantime, this is a good time to make a new one. So let's go. I dug through the scrap pile and I found this little piece of hex bar stock and this long piece of round bar, which I think I can use to make my new little scriber. Lately, you've noticed me using this Starrett scriber, which was donated to the channel, and I like it, but comparing it to a ballpoint pen, you can see how much shorter it is, and I like the length of a ballpoint pen. It fits nicely in my hand. So I want something a little bit longer for my own scriber. The Starrett one is kind of a little bit short for me, and it kind of gets jammed up in my palm in awkward ways, so I think I want to improve on that a little bit. But I do like this little hexagonal ball thing that it has at the end of it, which keeps it from rolling away when you set it down on an uneven surface. So I'm going to steal that idea from the Starrett one. Now, of course, the Starrett one has a fancy carbide point on it that would be difficult for the home gamer to replicate. However, I can steal an idea from ClickSpring to solve this problem, which is to use a sewing needle. Sewing needles, if you're not familiar, are extremely, extremely hard steel. And of course, they're extremely sharp, and for that reason, they make great scriber tips. So I'm using a number 16 sewing needle here, which is 62 thou, or about 1.6 millimeters thick. And this is, I find, a good size for a scriber point. So I'm going to cut my round bar to length first, once again using my ballpoint pen as a length guide, plus a few inches extra for holding on to the material. And I'll cut this to length. I don't have my bandsaw set up yet, so I'm going to use the character builder saw like a chump. Over to the lathe now. This is a lathe only project, which makes it great for beginners. And there's no great precision required here anywhere. I will start by facing off the end, as is tradition. And I'm going to put a very small number one center in it. Basically the smallest center that I can get away with for reasons that will be clear here later on. I'm now going to pull the stock out and set up for turning. But of course this actually isn't good practice for maximum precision here because the center might be off now that we've pulled the stock out if there's a bend in the stock or any other kind of imperfections. And the three jaw chuck position has changed so we've lost some concentricity there as well. This just being a hand tool though it doesn't matter and it saved us setting up the steady rest just to put a center in the end of this stock. So it doesn't matter here but it's good to know correct practice for someday when it will matter. I'm just taking a light skim cut all the way down the stock to clean it up and make it nice and round and making sure that I go further than the final length that I'm going to want. I'm going to put a nice taper on the end of this now, just like a pen. It looks nice and makes it easier to see what you're doing at the end of the scriber point. To do that, I'm going to swing the compound around to an angle that arbitrarily looks about right. I'm not measuring this or anything, I'm just kind of eyeballing the side of the compound there against the stock and judging what seems like an aesthetically pleasing angle. And I'll unlock my compound slide here so it'll move and then I'll get positioned here so that the tool is past the end of the stock when the compound is in its forwardmost position. And that will make sure I've got the travel here for this cutting operation. And away we go. I'm feeding in about 40 thou with the cross slide on each pass and then just winding the compound all the way down to make the cut. Now you'll note that my tool post is at an angle here such that it will clear the tail stock because I'm in kind of close here. But what this means is because of the grind on that tool, the cutting angle there of the tool is not ideal. I've effectively got a large negative lead angle on this tool. 
Generally on small lathes, you want the cutting edge perpendicular to the surface to minimize tool pressure. However, you can also use a small lead angle, which will improve surface finish at the cost of a little bit higher tool pressure. And in this case, I probably could have also rotated the tool post clockwise a little bit to get more of a perpendicular angle to the surface there, but that's okay because this is brass and you can get away with stuff like that with brass. If this was steel or a tougher material, then I would need to orient my tool post or grind a better tool such that the leading edge of the cutting tool was perpendicular to the work or had a positive lead angle. These are also really light cuts and you can get away with a lot when doing light cuts. Now it's time to prepare the sewing needle by cutting the stabby bit off the rest of it. About an inch of length here is all we need, but just make sure you do this with an abrasive tool of some sort. You absolutely cannot do this with side cutters or bolt cutters or a bandsaw or any kind of edged cutting tool. Again, sewing needles are very, very hard and you will destroy any cutter that you try to apply to it. And then even for deburring that cut, I'm using a stone and not any of my deburring tools because again, those are bladed tools and we have to stick to abrasives here. Now I can drill the hole in the end of the scriber for that needle. And for this, I'm going to use the steady rest. You might get away with not using a steady here. There is a lot of stick out, but we're also only drilling and it's a very tiny hole. So you might not need it, but I went ahead and set it up anyway, just to be sure. And I'm drilling this hole now instead of more towards the end because in a moment we're going to be knurling this surface and we won't be able to set up the steady anymore. So I think now is the time to do it even though it's a little bit awkward. I'm using WD-40 for cutting fluid there and I've got the lathe running wide open which is about 900 rpm but that's much too slow for a drill this small so I'm feeding very carefully and clearing chips very frequently. Just taking it real easy because the easiest way to break a small drill is to run it too slowly which is exactly what I'm doing here out of necessity. I'm starting with a number 53 drill which is actually only 59 thou, a couple thou smaller than the sewing needle. But I'm starting with this because if the grind on this drill isn't perfect or there's something about my setup that isn't perfect, then the drill is going to cut a couple thou oversize and I'm going to land right on. So I start with this one, but as you can see, the sewing needle doesn't quite want to go in. So then I actually run the same drill in again and back out. And sometimes that just kind of clears things out a little bit and then the thing will fit, but still no dice. So that drill is apparently cutting quite accurately and I had to go up a size to a number 52 drill. Now a 52 drill is actually a couple thou too large for the 61 thou sewing needle. There's no drill in between those two sizes, but that's okay. It's still close enough. And actually I got a really nice fit there. So that'll work out just fine. Job done. We can pull the steady rest out now. I went in about half an inch with those drills, by the way, and that seems to be about right. Now I can bring the tailstock back in and I'm just going to use it to apply very light pressure on the little hole that we just drilled just to give the stock a little bit of support there so that I can bring in the knurling tool. Because this is a scissor style knurler, it doesn't need a lot of tailstock support. It's squeezing from above and below, but the tailstock will help ensure that the stock doesn't get bent or pop out of the knurler or anything like that. So I clamp the knurler down just until I feel what seems like a good amount of resistance. And then I'm using lots and lots of cutting fluid here. Again, I'm using WD-40 because this is brass. I find that WD-40 makes a good cutting liquid for brass. And then I engage the power feed, which is very, very slow because the lathe is running slowly, but I sped up the footage here so that you don't fall asleep on me. And that looks like a pretty decent knurl. I'm still not a great knurler, but that's one of my better ones. I just started somewhere that looked like about right and ended somewhere that looked about right. Okay, I can part this thing off now. So once again, using my favorite ballpoint pen as a guideline for how long to make it. And then I'll shorten it up a bit to make room for the hexagonal brass knob that's gonna go on the end. 
So I'll mark this off, but I don't want to part it here because it's sticking too far out from the chuck. So I'm going to choke this guy up a little bit. Now when you do this, be careful that the jaws are gripping entirely on a section of the stock that's all the same diameter. Because remember, I did turn this down 10 thou, so if those jaws were gripping partly on the original stock and partly on my turned surface, that would be a poor grip and the stock would chatter on that cutting blade. And first new shop Yahtzee. I'll flip the part around now in the chuck. And once again, this is fine because we're just making a simple scriber, but if maintaining concentricity was important, you would not want to flip the part in a three jaw like this. You'd have to switch to something like a collet chuck or switch to a four jaw and dial it in, something like that. And I've protected the stock from the jaws with aluminum shim there. And by that, I mean scraps of soda can, which is remarkably consistent in thickness thanks to modern manufacturing. After facing that in to clean it up, I can now center drill and come in with the tapping drill size for a 1032 thread, which I chose arbitrarily as seeming like a good size to attach the knob on the back here. I'll put a little chamfer on that to help the threads start. And I can go get the tap. And it was at this moment that I realized I have not yet unpacked my tap and die drawer. I thought I had unpacked all my tooling drawers, but Turns out I missed one. So while I do that, please enjoy this footage of Sprocket spinning on an office chair. Now, where was I? Ah yes, tap and die. So I'll bring in my 1032 tap and the spring-loaded tap follower that I made on this channel many years ago. It's still serving me very well. And let's go ahead and tap this thread. I made the hole extra deep so that I just have to use the taper tap and don't have to bother with the bottoming tap here. And that is it for the body of this scriber. It's a very simple part, not a lot of precision required anywhere. Lots of fun to make. On to that little scrap of hex bar that I found now, and I'm gonna make a little knob for the back, just like the Starrett scriber at the top of the show. It's got a bunch of detritus on the end from some previous projects that I will face off, as is tradition. And now I can come in and I'm going to turn a round section at the back here for the thread that's going to go into the end of the body of the scriber. I'm going to turn this all the way down to the major diameter of 1032, eh, minus a few thousandths for clearance for the die. I'll put a nice chamfer on the end of that because chamfers are what separate us from the animals. And now I'm ready to bring in the die and cut the threads on there. This being a fine pitched thread, it's easy to start in brass. Sometimes coarse threads can be challenging to start in soft materials. So for those, I'll turn them a little further under size, even going as low as 10 thousandths under nominal. And I'll also apply pressure with the tailstock to get that die started. Finally, I'll use the parting blade to put a little undercut at the base of that thread there to make sure that the shoulder of that hexagonal section will seat tightly on the end of the scriber. And a quick test fit with the body. And as I was doing this, I was thinking, you know, I made that thread awfully long. Why did I do that? And yeah, it's too long. So I went ahead and faced it down quite a ways. And put the animal separating chamfer back on there. That's looking much more reasonable. It's still longer than necessary, but you know, might as well overbuild the scriber, right? And that seats down tightly now, so that's excellent. Now to copy a design detail from the Starrett scriber, I'm going to put a heavy chamfer on the hexagonal section until it meets up with the diameter of the body of the scriber, because I think that'll look nice. I just did this by trial and error, taking a little bit more off of that chamfer each time until the diameter at the center there was the same as the body of the scriber. And then that I'm very happy with, so now we can take that part out flip it around and finish the other side. I'm only gripping it with one tooth on the jaws here because I want to keep that hexagonal portion as short as possible. And I've got quite a bit of material to remove from the end, so I thought, eh, I'll try doing this with the parting blade. And I had a little voice telling me, you know, this is probably a bad idea. And it was a really bad idea. Always listen to that voice that's telling you something is a bad idea. One tooth on the jaws is not enough of a grip on the part to hold against the cutting forces of a parting blade. And I know better than to try that 
and I did anyway, and well, I paid the price. So I put it back in using two teeth, and I'm going to face it all the way down instead of trying to use the parting blade. This is much lower tool pressure, and that went fine. It just took longer. I was trying to save time with the parting blade, and of course ended up consuming much more time by doing it wrong the first time. So with that faced down, now I can pull it out to the one tooth for this last little operation here. I am going to have to hold it on one tooth again, but this should be fine. It's not a parting blade getting banged on by a hexagonal profile. I'm going to score up the tool post, bring in the chamfering tool, and once again chamfer that all the way down to a diameter that matches the body. And that went very well. Let's take a little educational sidebar and not waste the opportunity of learning from my little mistake there. There's a number of better work holding methods I could have used to prevent that part from popping out of the jaws like that. One way would have been to use the body of the scriber, for example, and just thread that hexagonal piece right into it and then hold the body of the scriber with shim stock to protect it. That would have worked just fine, I'm sure. Another option would have been to make the part from larger stock and make it all in one setup, cutting the chamfer on the back side and then parting it off right at the end, while always holding on to longer hex stock in the three jaw. You could also hold those threads in a collet chuck, which would not damage the threads and give a much better grip than what I did. So lots of better ways to do it. And it goes to show that even though I've made hundreds of parts like this over the last several years, you can always make mistakes and the price of quality machining is eternal vigilance. So there's the final knob. The sides are a little chewed up from where it got ripped out of the jaws, but that'll clean up somewhat on the scotch Bright wheel and eh, the rest will be character. So I'll give it a little shine here on the scotch Bright just to make it look nice. It's going to tarnish anyway, but you know, for a little while it'll look all shiny. Long enough to take fancy photos for YouTube. Time to install the needle in the end now. For this I'm going to use Loctite 603. If the fit is a little bit looser, you can also use Loctite 680, which is a higher viscosity version of 603. 603 is awesome stuff though. Even with most slip fits, I find it works just fine. This is the really clever bit about ClickSpring's design, because if this needle ever bends or breaks or dulls, you can just heat up the end of the scriber a little bit to break that Loctite. The needle will fall out, and you can put a new one in. It's very, very clever. That Chris is a smart bloke. Well, it looks the part, but does it actually scribe? Let's find out. Here's a piece of scrap that has some layout dye on it, and we'll give that a little scribey scrab. And look at that. That is a beautiful, beautiful, precise line. The line below there was actually done with the commercial Sterrett scriber, so you can see that the sewing needle actually makes quite a bit finer, more precise scribe line. Very pleased with that. Well, there's the final result. I think this thing will serve me well for many more years or until I lose it again, whichever comes first. I hope you enjoyed watching me make this thing. I definitely strongly recommend this as a beginner project. Not only is it lathe only, but you can personalize it in lots of different ways. If you don't want to do the knurling, you can do a series of grooves for the hand grip. That's what my previous scriber had done, which I think is what Clickspring did in his video. Lots of ways to have fun with this. No real precision required anywhere except for the hole that holds the needle and everything else you can just have fun with. So give it a shot and hey, go ahead and post pictures on the Blondie Hacks Patreon if you make your own. I'd like to see your versions of it. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons who support this channel and make all this content possible. And I'll see you next time.